From the turtles, happy together. So happy together. To the Doobie Brothers, what a fool believes. Let's revisit some incredibly awesome but commonly forgotten monster hits. I remember when this song came out. We cover how they exploded and took over the radio airwaves because these songs defined a generation, or maybe even two. The tunes that brought us together but desperately need a comeback. If you enjoy this playlist, be sure to subscribe to our channel and hit that thumbs up button. Our first decade brought us some of the best of these near forgotten hits. So come on and let's go back to the groovy 1960s. These boots are made for walking, Nancy Sinatra. One of these days these boots are gonna walk all over you. In 1965, Frank Sinatra's eldest daughter, Nancy Sinatra, walked into and all over our hearts when she released this hit. With a walking bass line that she strutted all over, the single is an excellent example of mid-60s grooviness, helped along by copious use of an instrument sadly lacking in modern music, the tambourine. These Boots was written by Sinatra's longtime musical partner, Lee Hazelwood, who also intended to sing the song himself, until Sinatra correctly pointed out that the song would be, quote, harsh and abusive, coming from a guy. One of these days, these boots are gonna walk all over you. Seems a lot more ominous and threatening if a man is singing it. Although there have been numerous covers of the song by such varied artists as Billy Ray Cyrus and Megadeth, Nancy's original recording remains both the definitive and best version out there. While not played much on the radio, the song can still be found stomping away in such movies as Full Metal Jacket and Austin Powers. Happy Together, The Turtles. So very fine, so happy together. The Beatles. The Monkees, The Turtles? You can be forgiven for forgetting that the last of these animalistic bands existed, as history has largely left them behind. And yet, put on their 1967 number one hit, Happy Together, and you'll find yourself saying, oh yeah, I love this song. Why don't I hear it more? The Turtles were struggling for traction in the competitive 60s Los Angeles music scene when they were approached by their label about recording a new single that 12 other groups had already passed on, Happy Together, which in hindsight seems almost criminal. The Turtles blended folk and psychedelia perfectly on this hit, resulting in mid-60s pop perfection that deserves to stand alongside the best recordings of the decade. Sadly, the magic was not to last, as the band were at loggerheads over the direction of the group, and they broke up just three years later. I guess they weren't all that happy together after all. Crimson and Clover, Tommy James and the Shondells. Do you ever wake up in the morning with one image or word lingering inexplicably from your dream? I have, but I never turned these random relics of my subconscious into a number one hit. One morning, singer Tommy James of Tommy James and the Shondells woke up with two words in his head, Crimson and Clover. He had no idea what they meant, but thought they would make a great song title. The song was a departure from the band's bubblegum pop past. It was tinged with psychedelia and featured a distinctive tremolo effect in which both the song's guitar and vocals would vibrate in time to the single's tempo. After an appearance by the band on The Ed Sullivan Show, Crimson and Clover shot to number one and spent more than 16 weeks on the charts, as it was number one during Christmas time. At the end of the song, when the vocals are heavily processed, some listeners thought James was singing Christmas is over instead of Crimson and Clover. The song has been covered by such luminaries as Prince and Joan Jett, but it still doesn't get the recognition today that it deserves as a late 60s psychedelic triumph. House of the Rising Sun, The Animals. There is a house in New Orleans. While House of the Rising Sun might not be as forgotten as some other of the hits on this list, the story behind the song certainly is, because no one actually knows who wrote it. 
The earliest published lyrics date to 1925, but the song's origin probably spans back decades, if not centuries before that. Famous folk singers Woody Guthrie and Bob Dylan both tried their hands at it, but it wasn't until the Animals released their version in 1964 that the song truly became a masterpiece. House of the Rising Sun, at 4 minutes 30 seconds, with howling vocals and a pulsating organ, was hardly a typical 60s pop song. The Animals actually sang it at the end of their concerts to set them apart from other bands, but the crowds loved it, and after recording the single in only one take, the band had a hit on their hands. The song was one of the first to successfully blend rock and folk. Apparently, when Bob Dylan first heard the Animals' single, he leapt out of his car, pounded his trunk in excitement, and decided at that moment to go electric. You'll never walk alone. Jerry and the Pacemakers. Walk on. Managed by Brian Epstein. Recorded by George Martin. From Liverpool. Ah, this next song must be sung by the Beatles. Wait, it's not? It's understandable if you never heard of the Beatles' little sister of a band, Jerry and the Pacemakers, because history has not remembered them as well as some of their contemporaries. But you've definitely heard their 1963 hit, You'll Never Walk Alone. Originally written for the Broadway musical Carousel, the song is an uplifting exhortation to keep on trucking even when the world looks bleak. As long as you have hope in your heart, you'll never truly be alone. Although the song has largely been forgotten on this side of the pond, people in the UK will be very familiar with it, as the single is the unofficial anthem for Liverpool FC. The song is loudly sung by supporters before every home match. A tradition that took on a deeper emotional meaning after the Hillsborough disaster of 1989, in which 96 fans were crushed to death. Aquarius, let the sunshine in, the fifth dimension. This is the dawning of the age. Much like a butterfly flapping its wings, sometimes the smallest events have a big effect. One day, singer Billy Davis Jr. lost his wallet on a train, where it was found by a member of the crew of the Broadway hit Hair. So Davis went to see the show, fell in love with the song Aquarius, and insisted that his band, The Fifth Dimension, record it. When the other members of the band pointed out that it was barely half a finished song, he replied that they would combine it with another of the musical's numbers, which, although different in key and tempo, Davis resolved to quote, jam together like two trains. And thus was born the perfect song for the late 60s. Just like the hippie movement gaining steam around the country, Aquarius dreamed of a near future where peace and love reign, where free minds guide the future of humanity. And also just like the hippie movement, the song remains a relic of the past. Although it's awesomely silly and fun, the single rarely gets played today. So come on, let the sunshine in. 96 Tears, Question Mark, and the Mysterians. You're gonna cry, 96 Tears, you're gonna cry. It seems bizarre that history hasn't been more kind to a song with as catchy an organ rip as 96 Tears, but so goes the fickle tides of taste. When the band released their 1966 hit, it quickly soared to the top of the charts, perhaps lessening the amount of tears the band was crying. Not only was the song a smash hit in its own time, but the single foresaw the future of rock music. 96 Tears, with its simple instrumentation and relentless pace, was one of the first successes for the burgeoning genre of garage rock, and has been credited with being one of the songs that influenced the beginning of punk rock. It's been theorized that 96 was a censored version of the original 69, but lead singer Question Mark has denied this, instead stating that the number has a deep spiritual meaning for him. Bobby Balderrama, the lead guitarist, was only 14 when they recorded this incredible song, because as Q puts it, there's no age to rock and roll. And when asked, where did you get your name Question Mark? He coolly responded, Well, actually that is my name coming from a man who has stated that his soul is from Mars, and he once walked the Earth with dinosaurs? That sounds about right. Lola, the kinks. She said, Lola, L -O -L -A, Lola. 
inspired by their manager's night of drunken dancing with a lovely young lady with healthy amounts of stubble. The Kinks' hit, Lola, perfectly straddled the line between acoustic folk and hard rock. A muscular guitar riff combined with witty lyrics to spin a tale of mistaken identity that was undeniably catchy. Unsurprisingly, a song about the mysteries of cross-dressing was controversial in the US during the early 70s, and many radio stations faded the single out before Lola's biological sex was revealed. The song also faced problems in the UK, but for a completely different reason. Originally, the champagne at the club in Soho tasted just like Coca-Cola, but at that time, the BBC prohibited product placement, and the song was banned until the lyrics were hastily re-recorded as Cherry Cola. The song became a massive hit, and although we don't hear it as much today, music's first blatantly gay rock ballad is still as awesome as ever. What a Fool Believes, the Doobie Brothers. The late 1970s were a time dominated by disco. At one point in 1979, six of the top ten songs on the Billboard charts were carbon copy disco clones. But then the Doobie Brothers released their hit, What a Fool Believes, and Saved Us All. Written by Michael McDonald and Kenny Loggins, What a Fool Believes follows the story of a man who attempts to rekindle a past romantic relationship before realizing there was never any love there in the first place. Sounds like a downer, but the single was anything but. With its upbeat, infectious melody and McDonald's crooning that shifts quickly from falsetto to comfortingly deep, What a Fool Believes was an instant hit and helped found the genre of yacht rock. The song was one of the only non-disco chart toppers of the year and went on to win the Grammys for best song and record. Maybe I don't hear the song as often today because my yacht is in the shop. But whatever the reason, What a Fool Believes remains as danceable as in 1979. Le Freak Chic. Although disco peaked in popularity in the late 1970s, it remains as inescapable as when John Travolta was shutting down the street in pants that were just the right brand of tight. But while hits such as I Will Survive and Hot Stuff are on constant rotation on the radio, it seems as if Le Freak gets less and less love every year, which is a crying shame because Sheik's 1979 masterpiece is the epitome of everything that is disco. The song was written about an incident in which Sheik members Niall Rogers and Bernard Edwards attempted to attend a party at New York's famous Studio 54. The notoriously surly bouncers didn't recognize the duo, refused them entry, slammed the door in their faces, and were probably probably fire the next day. In fact, the song's original refrain was F off, not freak out. Apparently a direct quote from the bouncers that night. With an irresistible rhythm and super simple yet catchy two-word chorus, Le Freak became the first song to reach number one three times and should be mandatory listening at any dance party. Come and get your love, Redbone. It's hard to imagine why Come and Get Your Love isn't played constantly on any device capable of playing music. Instantly recognizable guitar riff? Check. Upbeat, insanely catchy lyrics? Check. Makes you want to dance? Definitely check. But for some reason, it's not. Come and Get Your Love was the brainchild of Native American band Redbone, who shot to fame on the back of their 1973 hit. But unfortunately, after the success of their biggest hit, Redbone slowly slipped back into obscurity, and their music was played with increasing rarity. In fact, the group is so little known today that an imposter band tore the country in the early 2000s, purporting to be Redbone, playing state fairs and small concerts until the real Redbone found out and put a stop to it. Speaking of, anybody want to do a Hall & Oates tour with me? Ow, the oats. Although we still don't hear Come and Get Your Love enough to suit me, the song did have a mini renaissance when it was featured in the Marvel movie Guardians of the Galaxy in 2014. Cars, Gary Newman. 
you'd be forgiven for thinking that Gary Newman's hit single Cars came out in the 1980s with its funky, synthesizer-driven melody and emotionlessly delivered lyrics. Cars seems like the prototypical 80s song, except that it came out in 1979. Newman wrote the song after a road rage incident in which people in traffic went mental, attacked him, and tried to pull him from his car. Fortunately, he was able to lock his door and create, as he put it, his own personal empire where he felt safest of all. Newman took that harrowing experience and turned it into a pioneering hit single that helped pave the way for new wave music to dominate the airwaves for the next decade. The music video for Cars was also super popular, but ironically featured not one image of a car. In 1979, the song sounded like the future, but now it's a nostalgic look at the past that's still impossible to get out of your head. The next time you're on your morning commute, I know the perfect song for you to throw on. Right place, wrong time, Dr. John. Dr. John was the voodoo master of New Orleans funk, and in Right Place, Wrong Time, he crafted a masterpiece about a man suffering through a series of instances of ironic bad luck distinctive raspy vocals, combined with a pulsating rhythm to create a perfect fusion of funk, R&B, and just plain weirdness. Such musical legends as Bob Dylan and Bette Midler contributed couplets to the single, and the resulting lyrics are offbeat, both literally and figuratively. At one point, Dr. John sings that he just needs a little brain salad surgery, and that refried confusion is making itself known. Not quite sure what that means, but it sure sounds awesome. The message of Right Place, Wrong Time is also eminently relatable, because who hasn't been on the right road but in the wrong car before? I know I am all the time. Even with all these things going for it, Dr. John's hit is largely forgotten now, so I'm going to have to ask everyone to start singing it in the shower, because that is both the right place and the right time to boogie down. Life on Mars, David Bowie. While certainly among David Bowie's best ever songs, Life on Mars is one of the Thin White Duke's hits that gets the least airtime on modern radio. The song, filled with surreal, almost unfathomable imagery, and with a haunting string section that powers to a rousing climax, is a dolly painting come to life, and the song's origins are just as bizarre as the lyrics themselves. In 1967, Bowie wrote a song set to the French melody, Comme d'habitude, that was never released, but Paul Anka bought the song's rights and reworked it into Frank Sinatra's smash hit My Way. In response, Bowie took the same basic tune and wrote Life on Mars. As a parody of Sinatra's single, the liner notes even say, inspired by Frankie. Although not featured on the radio as much as some other of Bowie's better known hits, Life on Mars has sprung up sporadically over the years in pop culture, most notably scoring a stoned Bill Murray in the Life Aquatic of Steve Zissou. Then in 2018, on the car's stereo when Tesla blasted their roadster into space. Rock me Amadeus, Falco. <laughs> There has never been a pop song quite like Falco's 1985 hit. And keep in mind that it A was the first German language song to hit number one on the Billboard charts. And B is about the life and times of composer and all around musical genius Mozart. And C has music that sounds like the 80s crashed headfirst into the Industrial Revolution, and the two had a baby raised in space. So if those facts don't pique your interest, I don't know what will. Because Rock Me Amadeus is the perfect example of 1980s excess in music, from its thundering beat to its ridiculous subject. It is one of the best pump-up songs of not only the 80s, but any decade. And these days, Falco's gem gets lost in the shuffle, and we don't let Amadeus rock us nearly enough. With or without you, you too. With or without you. Whatever your feelings on Bono, The Edge, and the rest of you too, at the height of their powers, they undoubtedly released some pretty fantastic music. And nothing marked the height of their powers quite like With or Without You, the lead single off their mega hit Joshua Tree. And with an expansive, ethereal sound that perfectly epitomizes the wide open desolation of its album's namesake, the song effortlessly transports you to a place where you feel you might actually be the last human on earth. 
Unfortunately, today U2 is more known for being pompous windbags, who sneakily force anyone with an iPhone to download their mediocre 2014 album Songs of Innocence. Bono, you are not innocent, get this off my iPod. But they should be known for their early musical triumphs, and With or Without You doesn't get as much airplay as its awesomeness deserves. The Killing Moon, Echo and the Bunny Man. Fate up against a windmill. The 80s was the golden generation for synth driven pop music, so it's only natural that some absolute triumphs would get lost in the traffic. And so it is with Echo and the Bunny Man's single The Killing Moon, which I think is one of the most hauntingly beautiful songs of the decade. With strings expertly layered over synthesizer, guitar, and drums, The Killing Moon almost seems to be a snapshot of another world, a shadow realm full of mystery and magic. Enhancing this vaguely unsettling mood is the fact that the song's chords are borrowed from David Bowie's space oddity, only in a true oddity played completely backwards. This song was a hit when it was released in 1984, but today it just doesn't get the credit its genuine awesomeness merits. Higher Love, Steve Winwood. You know your go-to song you sing in the shower? That tune which is perfect to just belt out for no one to hear. Well, Steve Winwood's 1986 banger Higher Love is not just one of those songs. It's a song deserving to be screamed from the top of the tallest mountain in the middle of a sunny summer downpour. It may hover a bit on the cheesy side, but hey, so does the whole decade of the 80s. And it doesn't make Higher Love any less Awesome. Of course, the 1990 Whitney Houston cover followed by a 2019 dance remix may have cut down on the plays of the original, but do yourself a favor, and the next time you're in your car, crank what may be Yacht Rock's finest moment and blare Winwood's original to 11, cause this one goes to 11. Dancing in the Street, David Bowie and Mick Jagger. In the mid 80s, rock legends David Bowie and Mick Jagger wanted to collaborate, and the song they settled on was Dancing in the Street, penned by Marvin Gaye and originally performed by Martha and the Vandellas. Now, the song had already been covered by everyone from the Grateful Dead to Van Halen, but surprise, surprise, Bowie's and Jagger's version was the best yet. And then there's the music video, which is must-see TV at its finest. No, seriously, watch it. If you had never heard of the Rolling Stones or Ziggy Stardust, you'd be forgiven for thinking that these two were just two geriatric dads, with the fashion sense of a precocious eight-year-old and even worse dance moves. In other words, it's one of the most awesome things the 80s ever produced, both the song and the music video travesty. Dancing in the Dark. Bruce Springsteen. This one's for higher, even if we're just dancing in the dark. Now, while we're on the subject of dancing and things, let's move from the street to the dark and talk about Bruce. In 1984, The Boss released his most popular album, Born in the USA, and along with it, his highest charting single, Dancing in the Dark. The song represented a departure for Bruce, as four years in, he finally embraced the 80s and added a synthesizer to a track for the first time ever. And the result was absolutely awesome. It was almost impossible not to sing along and dance to it, especially after seeing the music video and watching Springsteen and a very young Courtney Cox do the widest dance of all time. A dance, mind you, that partly inspired the Alfonso Ribeiro's Carlton from Fresh Prince. These days, Dancing in the Dark is overshadowed by its album's eponymous track. A sad fact considering how much more fun cutting loose and just dancing in the dark is. I Melt With You, Modern English. I'll stop the world and melt with you. Looking for what is perhaps the perfect 80s pop song, the embodiment of everything that makes new wave music great. 
then look no further than Modern English's 1982 single I Melt With You, featuring dreamy guitar and synthesizer driven music coupled with lyrics about love in the time of an atomic blast. The song is the 80s made into music, and it's just incredibly catchy. Seriously, I dare you listen to it and not hum along at the end just before the drums come roaring back in. Today, Modern English is looked over when people list the best pop songs of the 80s. A surprising turn of events considering I Melt With You is among the 500 most played songs on the radio of all time. In a big country, big country. In a big country, dreams stay with you. Bagpipes are simply not very cool, being generally associated with Scotsmen, funerals, and bleeding ears. So how did Scottish rockers Big Country get around this drawback on their hit? By tuning their guitars to evoke the sound of their national instrument, thereby saving us all from the awful warbles of an inflated sheepskin. No, seriously, whatever they did, this single was a towering triumph that served as both a tribute to their national heritage and a kick-ass song that swallowed you whole in a wall of sound. In a Big Country was so popular in the 80s that the video played on a near loop on MTV. If you sat and watched for 45 minutes, chances are Big Country in all their new wave glory would soon be plastered on your screen yet again. Betty Davis Eyes, Kim Carnes. Everybody knows who Kim Carnes is, right? And remembers her hit single. But you can be forgiven if you answer no to either question, because I think Betty Davis Eyes is the best example of an 80s song that is completely awesome, but it slips out of your mind as soon as it's over. One second you'll be jamming hard, and five minutes later you won't remember Kim Carnes exists. Which is wild, because Betty Davis Eyes was the biggest song of 1981. The song spent nine weeks at number one and won the Grammy for both song and record of the year. The song's namesake was also a big fan. Betty Davis wrote a letter to the song's writers thanking them for making her relevant in the modern age. And she even sent them roses when they won the Grammys. Now that's class. All right, before music class is dismissed, we do have one more bonus decade to highlight. So let's go way back and hear some truly forgotten classics from the 1950s. Maybelline, Chuck Berry. Oh, Maybelline, why can't you eat me? When you think of legendary rock and roll pioneer Chuck Berry, the first two songs that spring to mind are his classics Johnny B. Good and Roll Over Beethoven. But it was 1955's Maybelline that first shot Berry to stardom and helped create rock music as we know it. With its raucous guitar riffs and classic rock subject of fast cars and teenage heartbreak, Maybelline was universally loved. In fact, it was one of the first songs that was a hit on all three of the rhythm in blues, country and western, and pop charts. While it may not get as much airplay as some of Barry's other hits these days, Maybelline might have had the biggest impact on the emerging genre of rock. Barry's guitar playing on this song is so influential that Rolling Stone magazine simply states, quote, rock and roll guitar starts here. Everyone from Clapton to Cobain certainly owes Chuck Berry a big ol' thank you for Maybelline. Walking After Midnight, Patsy Cline. I go out walking after midnight. Anyone who has experienced the loneliness and dejection of heartbreak can relate to the mournful lyrics of Patsy Cline's 1957 single, Walking After Midnight. Originally written for pop singer Kay Starr, she rejected it, and the song sat unused on the shelf for three years. Cline was also initially hesitant to release the song. It wasn't until after a performance on Arthur Godfrey's Talent Scouts, in which the audience reaction broke the in-house applause meter, that she rushed to put the single out. Walking After Midnight blends blues and country to great effect, beautifully painting a portrait of a spurned lover adrift in the world. And audiences loved it. The song went to number two on the country charts and made Patsy Cline a star. While she may be better known for her 1960s hits like Crazy, Walking After Midnight might best distill Cline's unique combination of pop, blues, jazz, and country down to its pure essence. 
That'll be the day, Buddy Holly. Cause that'll be the day when I die. The world almost didn't get to experience the awesomeness that is Buddy Holly's first hit song. Holly's record label was unhappy with the performance of Holly's previous singles and refused to release it. So Buddy formed a new band, The Crickets, signed to a new record label, and the rest is history. That'll Be The Day was among the first wave of massive rock and roll hits to sweep the nation. It shot to number one on the charts, and Holly and The Crickets are credited with popularizing the standard rock lineup of two guitarists, one bass player, one drummer. Unfortunately for all of us, That'll Be The Day ended up being one of the last recordings released by Holly, as he tragically died in a plane crash in 1959, synonymous with the day the music died. The influence of That'll Be The Day didn't die with him, though. A cover of the song was the first thing ever recorded by the Quarrymen, a group that would evolve into a little-known band named The Beatles. Cherry Pink and Apple Blossom White, Perez Prado. <laughs> A wave of mambo fever swept the nation in the 1950s, and the man in the eye of the storm was Cuban band leader Perez Prado. America had gotten its first taste of Perez's Latin flair when he released Mambo No. 5 in 1950. <laughs> But the craze didn't reach its peak until the release of 1955's Cherry Pink and Apple Blossom White. This song, an up-tempo, irresistibly catchy instrumental, flew up the charts, staying at number one for 10 weeks and selling a million copies. Perez recorded Cherry Pink and Apple Blossom White for the film Underwater, with Jane Russell famously dancing to the song. Which makes perfect sense, because who hears the trumpet and doesn't start shaking their hips? Unfortunately, the popularity of the mambo nosedived with the end of the 50s, and today Prado's gym isn't heard nearly enough. But if you ever want a sure way to get a party started, throw cherry pink on, and people will be grooving in no time. Whole lot of shaking going on. Jerry Lee Lewis. Lewis got his hands on the song Whole Lotta Shakin' Going On, an R&B song about dancing. He then added his trademark propulsive piano, suggestive spoken asides, and turned the speed up to about a billion. And voila, a rock and roll classic about, um, adult dancing. And this song was an instant hit, and the world was introduced to The Killer. Although he's remembered more today for Great Balls of Fire. In my mind, this world is fine. Great balls of fire. It was this tune that had been described as the quintessential rockabilly anthem that truly established Lewis's greatness. And Jerry Lee Lewis is still rocking out today. You should check out our rundown on some legendary rockers still going at it even after turning 80. Man, I just want to make it to 65. You send me Sam Cooke. Darling, you. Sam Cooke basically invented soul music and paved the way for greats like Aretha Franklin and Marvin Gaye to follow in his footsteps. And it all began with You Send Me, Cooke's first single, a love song that introduced the public to Cooke's almost impossibly smooth singing voice, like velvet gliding across a baby's bare bottom. Yeah, I said it. And the public loved it. You Send Me shot to number one on the R&B charts, however record companies were were skeptical that a black artist could have crossover appeal, and in a move typical of the times, had a white singer, Teresa Brewer, record a version aimed at the pop chart. I know you send me aka white people. But in a slap to the face of racists everywhere, Cook's version also went to number one on the pop charts, significantly outperforming Brewer's version. Overnight, Cook became a massive star, beloved by everyone, white, black, old, young, and the godfather of soul was born. Rocket 88, Jackie Brenston and his Delta Cats. You 
women have heard of jalopy, you've heard the noise they make, but let me introduce my new Rocket 88. Well, aside from being an outstanding song in its own right, Rocket 88 is acknowledged as the first rock song recorded ever. Now let's let that sink in. Credited to Jackie Brenston and his Delta Cats, who were actually Ike Turner and his Kings of Rhythm. Rocket 88 merged jump blues and up-tempo swing. The song also features one of the first known recordings of a distorted guitar. The band's bass amp had been damaged, and producer Sam Phillips filled it with newspaper in an attempt to fix it. It didn't work, but the resulting fuzz sound was kept and the rest is history. Ike Turner would go on to have great success working with wife Tina in the 60s and 70s, but people forget he got his start by basically inventing rock music. Alright, that's it for now. I hope you enjoyed our forgotten playlist. So, did we miss any incredible song that for some reason doesn't get much love anymore? If so, please add it in the comments, because we would love to do another episode like this. If you enjoyed today's video, please give it a thumbs up to show your support. Subscribe to our channel so you never miss a memory. But most of all, from all of us here at Do You Remember, we want to thank you very much for watching.